to almost wipe them off the earth. So there was a curse because there was a covenant broken, and God began to uh, discipline Israel because of that. Uh, and you have an example of, of David showing a great deal of humility, going to the Gibeonites and seeking what they would require to lift this uh, discipline because they had violated the covenant. Uh, we see a picture of David's humility. We see a picture of a man after God's own heart. We also see a picture, a very clear picture, that God keeps his word. He's a covenant-keeping God. And Saul broke the covenant that the leaders of Israel made with the Gibeonites, and so as a result of that, there was discipline just as God said there would be discipline when you break the covenant. And there was, and David dealt with it really well. So we have that example. This time, in verses 15 through 22, we have an example of military victories. And this is God fulfilling in Israel or, or doing what he says he will do um, uh, through Israel. And we'll see that at the very, very uh, last of the message We'll see in 2 Samuel chapter uh, 3 and verse 18 what he says that's going to shine a lot of light on everything that we read about here. A lot of names in verses 15 through 22, a lot of names, a lot of peop, uh, territory that is going to be very difficult to uh, pronounce. In fact, I won't pronounce them probably, not because I choose not to, but because I just cannot. How's that? Uh, pronounce some of these names and some of these places when we get to them, and you'll, you'll see why. Now, David's establishment as a king over united Israel provoked the fear and the jealousy of the Philistines, and they twice invaded Israelite territory to attack David, and they were twice decisively feat, defeated near Jerusalem in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verses 17 through 25. And David wisely followed up with a counterattack um, invading uh, Philistia, which further uh, destroyed their ability to make war or wage war against Israel. And then there was the capture of Gath, and that's written about in 1 Chronicles chapter 18 and verse 1, and additional conquest and victories and brief campaigns that we see expressed here that we likely do not see anywhere else in Scripture. We know there were more than just two um, attacks um, by the Philistines and being defeated by David. We know there were more than two. There were lots of other things that took place. There was more than just the capture of Gath. And in verses 15 through 22, we see uh, some story, some detail on some of those other smaller battles. And that's why we have, one reason why we have this kind of information. God is going to show his faithfulness through giving uh, Israel the victory in some of these battles. So following these campaigns that we read about in verses 15 through 22, which is just barely a scratch given about them, but following them, the Philistines are so completely subjugated that the power of their this the power of their um, might, their military might, is is brought down to such a low level that they cease to be a threat to Israel from this point on. And in fact, the latter part of David's reign, all the way through Solomon's reign, you. You might see one or two references, but I'll, I think you will not see any references to the Philistines at all. When David came to power, and David finally subjugated them to a point where they were no longer um, a threat to Israel. So you don't hear anything about them because David, God enabled David to deal with them appropriately, and they, they, uh, they never recovered from that. Well, this little section here includes a list of the giant killers and their victims. There are four accounts of war coupled with the word again, and in each is followed by a Philistine aggressor and the Israelite who killed him. And the names and the places, of course, are unfamiliar and they're strange to us and they're seemingly almost impossible to pronounce. 
So they, they are unfamiliar to us, but to the generations that follow David, it is the stuff of which young men dream and the, the fuel for swelling patriotism. patriotism. Here is uh, this man from Bethlehem, and here is this man from Judah, and here is Audie Murphy, and here is uh, these guys over here, and here is this team over here that did this. That's the stuff that builds patriotism. It's the, young, the stuff that young men dream of. So though it doesn't mean anything to us, modern readers, to the generations that follow David, this is good reading. This is the stuff that uh, you want. This is, these are the men you want to be like. I want to be like Audie Murphy. I want to be like whoever. Uh, some of these guys. So the place names and the clan names drew special attention. Perhaps there was some sort of banners or something that they would that they would uh, put in place of, of the uh, major city within their territory, whatever tribe it was. But evidently, David had two elite groups of soldiers. There was the smaller, more important group, and there was three within that group. They were in a unique class all their own. They were accorded that status because of the deeds of extraordinary valor that they did. And that group right there is made up, is uh, spoken about in chapter 23 in verses 8 through 12. Chapter 23 in verses 8 through 12. And then there is a larger group, a group of 30, and that's in the remainder of chapter 23, verses 18 through 39. There's this group of 30, or 13, 13 through 39. That group uh, may well have been an, uh, some sort of elite unit that fought. Uh, courage, strength, ability, endurance were the special characteristics or the virtues of these kinds of soldiers. The characteristics highlighted in this section that we see here in chapter 21, verses 15 through 22, the particular characteristics were their loyalty and devotion to David. And we'll see that as it comes out around verses 18. Verse 17 and 18, it'll come out around around there. They were highly devoted, highly loyal to David. They were the men of the day who would be considered the invincibles. Not even giant-sized Philistines could match them. And, of course, the critics of Scripture jump all over this. This is impossible. You really believe in fairy tales. I mean, I can read about, you know, Aesop's fables and all that kind of stuff, and I can read all this other stuff about giant trolls and all this other kind of th stuff, and I really don't believe anything that they write. They're just stories made up. Why would I believe this is, is accurate and that there really were giants? Well, you and I, because we are believers, we know this. Scripture is given to us, and all of it is inspired, and it's profitable for correction, teaching, reproof, and training of, for righteousness. We know, according to 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, that no prophecy, nothing was ever given uh, by man, nothing was ever motivated by man. Men were moved by God, by the Holy Spirit, to write things. And though they wrote them with their own personality expressed in there, they wrote accurately what God intended for them to write. We see, thus saith the Lord, uh, several, a couple of thousand times uh, throughout Scripture. We know this is the Word of God. Uh, we, we are confident of that. And so when it says uh, they were of the uh, Raphaim, which is the giants, then we have really no reason to believe that they were not extraordinarily tall men. The description given to Goliath is about, is well over nine feet tall. Well over nine feet tall. The description given to his, the weight of his spear and his shield and things like that are just all, it would be impossible for a man as you and I know of man to handle that kind of machine, that kind of weaponry and still be able to stay alive and not, and not fall on him and crush him. But scripture doesn't lie. It is truthful. Where all of the fables 
and where all of the stories and where all of the mythology uh, that you see in the foreign gods and the writings of the Romans and the Greeks and everybody else, you know where it comes from. It comes from Scripture. Genesis chapter 6, remember the uh, sons, the... Um, Sons of God cohabitated with the daughters of men, and it produced giants. Where do you think Greek mythology comes from? Genesis chapter 6. What are Greek gods? Half God and half man. That's Genesis 6. Or that's where they get it from, the Genesis 6. So the ideas come from Scripture. The Scripture writes about them. Not that, not that Scripture wrote them before anything happened necessarily, but the ideas come from Scripture. But that doesn't mean that Scripture follows the fairy tale lead of all the writings. So we have to, we really should be confident, and I think we are confident in that. These were giants. How tall exactly they were, we don't know. Uh, but they were uh, men who were, had unusual size and strength. Uh, compared to other men. So let's look at uh, some of these. Let's look at all these um, script, all these men here, one battle at a time, so to speak. And the first one comes in verses 15 through 17. So let's look at that one. Now, when the Philistines were at war with Israel, David went down and his servants with him. And as they fought against the Philistines, David became weary. Then Ishbibinab... Ish who was among the descendants of the giant, who the weight of whose spear was 300 shekels of bronze in weight, was girded with a new sword, and he intended to kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, helped him and struck the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swore to him, saying, You shall not go out again with us to battle, so that you do not extinguish the lamp of Israel. So, you notice that you have when the Philistines were at war again with Israel. Remember, each section includes uh, a, a giant killer um, and a giant, and it's all, all four of them mention war and all four of them mention again. You'll see that again in verse 18. Now, it came about after this that the war, there was war again with the Philistines. Two more times you'll see that. Four times through this section. So we're talking about four different skirmishes, battles, whatever size the battle was. Here are four different times between 15 and 22 in which Israel battled the Philistines. Different than the earlier accounts that we see in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 5 and verse 17 and following. So they're at war again, and this is probably before David's sin with Bathsheba probably before that, but maybe not too long before that, David became weary, it says, uh, in the battle, and evidently there was a man by the, by the name of Ish, Ishbi Benob, who was among the descendants of a giant. He saw, some, some way, he saw David. David was weary, and so he made a beeline to go kill David. And so that, for that reason, uh, the men said, after the battle, you shall not go out with us again. You are the light. You are the lamp of Israel. You cannot be extinguished. You cannot put yourself in a position where you may be killed. And whether David, these other men, there's no indication that these other men were, were weary. They were younger than David. Perhaps David is getting up a little bit in his years of fighting. Uh, whatever the reason, uh, he was weary, and one of the Philistines, ish Bibanob, is how you pronounce that one, ish Bibanob, <clears throat> and what it means is the inhabitants, the inhabitant of Nob, so evidently that's where he's from. This man was one of the descendants of the Rapha, or Raphaim, the giants. Uh, information about this giant uh, is very small. There's very, in fact, in all of these cases, there's not much information that we have <clears throat> on any of these guys. Uh, there's one commentator that um, speculates that uh, this man Ish B. Benob, um, 
and the other three Philistines that are mentioned here were members of an elite military unit devoted to, to a pagan god. Now, that's, that's possible that that's true, but we really don't know whether that's true or not. That's just one, one idea that's thrown out there. Ish Bibanob uh, possessed remarkable weaponry, remarkable weaponry. It's uh, his bronze spearhead weighed 300 shekels. That's seven and a half pounds. Have any of you ever thrown a shot put? Shot put is eight pounds, right? Eight pound shot. You can throw it, I don't know, 20 feet maybe. If you get a good, a good uh, 20 feet. Um, so if you're if you're got a the tip of your spear is a shot put, uh, this iron cannonball about yay round. If that's what it weighs on the end of it, you you usually don't handle a spear from the end of it. You handle it somewhere in the middle, which means he has the ability to hold that eight pounds about two feet in front of him, three feet in front of him, and wheel it around and kill men with it, which means he's pretty strong, pretty strong guy to do that. You want to try it out sometime, take a sledgehammer and just do this with your sledgehammer. Just hang it hand at the end of the handle and do that with your sledgehammer and see if you can. And you'll get just a little bit of an idea about that. So that's, this, uh, that's a little bit of a description of this man and his equipment. The Hebrew term for spearhead um, occurs as a noun with this meaning only here. However... It's Cain. Cain is the same name as Cain. <laughs> Cain, of course, was the first murderer. So he has a Cain. Uh, maybe he saw this as his weapon of murder. He's this weapon of, obviously, it's a weapon of, of uh, a weapon to, intended to kill people. He was armed with a, he says he, he was armed with an unnamed new weapon. It says there, the uh, New International Version, following some of the ancient versions, has speculated that it was a sword, but we really don't know what that new weapon was. The text does tell us that he was killed by Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, and Zeruiah is David's sister's son. So David had a sister. One of his sister's names was Zeruiah, and that's, that's who Abishai is. So uh, Abishai is David's nephew. We don't know his father's name. Scripture never tells us his father's name. And the history of Abishai, I mean, this, this guy who saved David's life, came out of nowhere, was uh, skilled in battle enough to gain the advantage over this guy and was able to kill him. But Abishai voluntary, you remember way back in 1 Samuel when David sneak, snuck down into the camp where Saul was at and he could have killed Saul, but I think they took a spear and maybe some water jugs one time. Well, the guy who was standing beside David that says that said, here it is. Here's the opportunity. God has delivered your enemy into your hand. You can kill him now. Was Abishai. That was him. So he did volunteer to accompany David to Saul's camp, camp one night. And he would have killed the sleeping Saul if David had not restrained him. Back in 1 Samuel 26. He also helped Job kill Abner, which is not a credit to his, his resume. Uh, Abner, who was Saul's general, and, and he did so in the revenge for the death of another brother uh, who was killed. Abner killed him because he was chasing him. Later, Abishai won a victory over the Edomites in 1 Chronicles chapter 18, and he was second in command in a decisive battle against the Ammonites in 1 Chronicles chapter 19. So Abishai was quite the warrior. Uh, this is a guy you want to have in the foxhole with you, so to speak. You want to have him with you, not fighting against you. He was often, however, vengeful, cruel. He wanted to behead the spiteful Shimei. Remember when Shimei was kicking dust and throwing dirt clods and stuff at David and his men when they had to get out of Jerusalem because Absalom was coming in to take over? He was the one that said, let me separate this guy 
so that he's no longer a threat so he, because he cursed you, the king. That's what he wanted to do, and David uh, intervened for in the case of Shimei at that point. And when King David fled beyond the Jordan, Abishai was given the command of one of David's three divisions which uh, crushed that rebellion of Absalom. And he is ranked among David's bravest warriors. We'll see his name come up again in chapter 23. In verse 18 and 19, his name comes up again. Quite a man. Evidently, um, David's family were good warriors. Um, David himself, Abishai here, there's a couple of other of David's relatives, cousins, brothers, who were uh, very skilled on the battlefield. So verse 17, after the battle was confronted, David was confronted by his loyal troops, and they established a new war policy that David referred to here as, and David is referred to here as the lamp of Israel. And that lamp of Israel, David would never again go out with his troops to battle. So, and he has, he gave him the title, Lamp of Israel. And it's used in the Bible only here for David, nowhere else. And it suggests that David's leadership was as valuable to the nation as a steady light source would be on a dark night. You are the Lamp of Israel. You're the lighthouse. Ships are not going to know where to go. They're going to go astray if you do not stay where you're at and stay safe. You are the Lamp of Israel. So that's, that's the title. It's an honorable title that they gave to him. So David apparently followed the rule because in the narratives that we have studied and we have read from chapter 11 through chapter 20 of 2 Samuel, David always assigned the leadership of his troops to either Joab, to Abishai, to Ittai, remember him, Ittai, chapter 18, verse 2, or Amasa, the very latest one in chapter 20, Amasa. David always assigned his leadership to one of these men uh, from chapters 11 through 20 in 2 Samuel. So evidently David listened to his men, understood the wisdom of what they said, and, um, and followed the course there. So what you, what you see on the, uh, uh, on the screen there National judgment is what we talked about last week. The military victory through his mighty men is what we're discussing now. And down at the very corresponding to that, military victory through mighty men, again in chapter 23, verses 8 through 39. That's where all of the discussion of the three and then the uh, 30 men will take place. So here's another battle in verse 18. Now it came about after this that there was war again with the Philistines at Gob. Then Sabichai, the Hushite, struck down Soph, who was among the descendants of the giant. Just one verse is devoted to this. Uh, Soph, S-A-P-H, is uh, another descendant of the uh, Raphaim, or the giants. Um... And he's known elsewhere as uh, Sippai, S-I-P-P-A-I. In 1 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 4, he's, his name is S-A-P-P-A-I. So if you're looking to Chronicles chapter 20 and you see that name, it's the same name spelled two different ways there. It is uh, supposed by some that he was the son, that this man here, was the, Sof, was the son of the giant Goliath. But it hasn't been proven. But there are people that have suggested that he is the, the son of, of Goliath. And David appears to have rewarded uh, Sabichai. And I know I'm not pronouncing that right. But David appears to have rewarded him, one of David's mighty men, in 1 Chronicles chapter 11 and verse 29, by making him the commander of a division of 24,000 men. So in Chronicles, uh, the book of Chronicles gives a history of Judah. 
the history of Judah. Kings, first and second Kings gives you a history. It'll, get, it'll go back and forth from Israel to Judah to Israel to Judah to one king to the next king. It goes back and forth. But Chronicles gives you a history of the southern kingdom, Judah. So some parallels we see in First Chronicles. And we see in First Chronicles uh, 11 that David rewarded this mighty man by giving him a division of 24,000 men. This man is a Hushathite. He was from the village of Husha, and it's in the located in the territory of Judah, uh, just a couple of miles southwest of Jerusalem. And uh, both Soph and Goliath were killed at Gob, the same place, which is a difficult place to identify. But... Um, you can read about that a little bit in First Chronicles chapter 20 again. And that's all I could find on these guys. There's just not much information that we know about them out there. So verse 19, there was war with the Philistines again at Gob, and Elhanan, the son of Jaari Oregim, the Bethlehemite, killed Goliath the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Well, you could probably uh, figure out what's wrong here at verse 19. And what is wrong here is it appears to contradict 1 Samuel chapter 17, where it says that David killed Goliath the Gittite. So Goliath the Gittite... Um, certainly was a real man but the question is is who killed him is is this scripture right or is first samuel chapter 17 right that's the big that's the controversial issue in this verse and it's the most controversial in this whole section here because it seems to contradict first samuel 17 verse 50 and verse 57 so what, we have, what helps us when we have something like this is to go to a parallel passage. And we have that in 1 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 5. In 1 Chronicles 20 and verse 5, it says that Elhanan slew Goliath's brother, Lami. And it has been suggested, that's what, that's what the verse says, it's been suggested that the tradition that Elhanan, Elhanan killed Goliath was the original, which later referred, was, or the, was later transferred to David. So what some critics of scripture will say is that what 1 Chronicles 20 and verse 5 is really true, and later they changed the name from Elhanan to David. And then they created all of this story of how David, this young boy, killed the giant, which was a huge motivating factor for the Israelites when, they were, when their kingdom was very young. Nice story, right? Ring, Lord of the Rings and all that kind of stuff. Nice story. But that's not what happened. Not what happened at all. Then... Um, the text in 2 Samuel, the truth is, the text here that we have here in 2 Samuel is the problem. Because you see the word in verse 19, you see the word O-R-E-G-I-M, Oregim. That word right there is the word for weavers, a weaver's beam. And it has been, that word right there became part of Elhanan's father's name. And Lami, the brother, has become the Bethlehemite. And it's a confusion that's understandable in light of the, the Hebrew. The Hebrew words for Bethlehemite and the Hebrew words for Lami, the brother, are so similar that it's almost certain that one is, one is a corruption of, other, of the other. So all that to say, 1 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 5 is probably accurate. And first and 2 Samuel chapter 21 and verse 19 has probably been confused a little bit because they are they look, if you put them side by side, they look very much alike. 
it's easy to understand that over the years in the copying of things that they would get that confused. The King, in fact, the King James Version already corrected it. The King James Version translates our passage here in 2 Samuel 21, 19. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines where Elhanan, the son of Jaro, Jaro Gim, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. So what the King James did was it took uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 5 and saw what it said. There was no question about what 1 Samuel 17 says. There's no question there. There's no confusion there. David killed Goliath. So that being true, that taken as, as the presupposition that that's true, and there's no questionable issues about what 1 Chronicles chapter 20 says, 2 Samuel must have been the one that's confused. And so what the King James did was it added the brother of, slew the brother of Goliath the Gittite, the spear, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. And it's probably a little surprising that more modern translations have not also corrected our text here in light of what 1 Chronicles says. That David fought and killed Goliath is beyond question in light of what 1 Samuel 17 says. And so it seems best to regard 1 Chronicles as true and original in its meaning. And so the confusion indeed is right here in the text and that's um, and it's confusing because the words look so much alike one another the letters do well this man Goliath the Gittite was killed by Elhanan he is as we've we've said a couple of times he is the son of Jaari or Jim uh, he is a Bethlehemite and we know very little about him other than he was from Bethlehem, he was a great warrior, uh, and he killed this giant. And the, uh, the last one, that's the third one, the last one that we see in verse 20 and 21. There was war at Gath again, where there was a man of great stature who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in number, and he also had been born to the giant. When he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimei, David's brother, struck him, struck him down. So I've called this the digital man. There is the digital man. I did a little bit of, just real brief, a little bit of research, just in case anybody says, well, this is impossible. This is proof that this is really fairy tale. It's not really true. Um, there are cases and genetically where people do have five fingers and five toes, or excuse me, six fingers and six toes. I actually have five. Um, six fingers and six toes on each hand. It's not unheard of. This is not a once in a lifetime. You've never heard of this since the beginning of the world, nor shall you afterwards. There are other accounts and writings of, of people who have genetically who, who have this. So this is not completely unusual this is the fourth Philistine who was killed in another battle which took place in Gath verse 20 says Gath is the heart of the Philistine territory and he was killed by a man named Jonathan David's nephew he's the son of Shimei, David's brother Shimei was one of his brothers that went off to battle one of his three brothers that went off to battle and then David's father sent him later, take some of this food and bread to the leaders of your brothers, the commanders of your brothers, and find out how your brothers are doing. Well, Shimei was one of those guys that was in the Israelite army. So he saw David kill his little brother, kill Goliath. Well, as it turns out, Shimei had a son whose name was Jonathan, and evidently he was a great warrior as well. And finally, the summary, you thought they would never get here. Finally, the summary in verse 22, these four were born to the giant 
in Gath, and they fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. That, of course, is a summary of all of this that is going on. And why are these defilers of Israel mentioned? That's the big question. Why is all this here? What does it have to do with anything? What it's doing is showing us God is faithful. In 2 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 18, there is a statement made there, and it's made by Abner. It's Abner's recognition that David is God's anointed and that he wishes to follow David and Israel, the northern tribes, should line themselves up behind David. So 2 Samuel 3, 18 says, Now then, do it, for the Lord has spoken of David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of their enemies. Here is an account of God being faithful to that statement. That's why it's here. To show the reader that God is a God of his word. That God does give victory. God will do what he says. He is not a God who forgets. He is not a God that omits things because he's in a different mood than he was when he originally said something. It's there because God wants to prove that he is faithful to Israel. He wants to give his people confidence that when he says something... He's going to do it. I'm not going to back out. I'm with you, lo, until the end of the age. Then I'm with you until the end of the age. I will not abandon you. Then I'm not going to abandon you. I will give you strength to know what to say when the day comes. Then he will give you strength to know what, the day when, know what to say when the day comes. He is a God who is a faithful God. That is a key element in our God. We must understand him and know him to be faithful. Otherwise, you cannot take one step without trusting him or without entrusting everything that you have into his care. Because if he is not faithful, he is not trustworthy. And if he is not trustworthy, then he is no God to follow. But he is. So you have this statement providentially in chapter 3, verse 18, and then you have an account, a special account, at the end of, this two, of these two books, a special account to show, prove to the reader that God did what he said he was going to do. So when you get to passages like Psalm 71, Psalm 71, and this is the prayer of an old man. When you get to Psalm 71 and this prayer, this man says in verse 4, Rescue me, O my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the grasp of the wrongdoer and ruthless man. For you are my hope, O Lord God, you are my confidence from my youth. By you I have been sustained from my birth. You are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. This is the kind of God that you serve. This is, you can have confidence, just as this man has confidence that the Lord has sustained you from your birth. He has taken care of you all these years, and lo, he will be with you always until the end. You can have this kind of confidence that is being expressed by this man in Psalm 71. He resolved in verse 14, but as for me, I will hope continually, and my praise and will praise you yet more and more. My mouth shall tell of your righteousness and of your salvation all day long, for I do not know the sum of them. You can have that kind of confidence because you know God is going to fulfill what he has said. Philippians 1, 6, the work he's began in you, he will complete. When the trumpet sounds and we go home to be with our Lord, he calls us church and we meet him in the air, so we will ever be with our Lord forever and ever. The dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are left will meet him in the air. Any moment coming. We live for the time. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. I'm not praying for the passing of time quickly. I'm praying for his coming quickly. Like now. Please come now. 
So this is the confidence that you can have. This is the intention of the writer in adding this here. It seems worthless. What am I going to get out of this? This is it. God is faithful. Don't ever forget. He's faithful. Now, would you like to have communion this evening? Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for your kindness and your blessings. Thank you for your